Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, abstract session three. I am uh, Nagaraj Nagati Hali from University of Miami. Congratulations to all the travel awardees in this session. Um, so we had excellent uh, abstract sessions yesterday and great dinner. So I am one of the moderator. Good morning, I'm Jill Smith from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Um, our first um, presentation is a virtual presentation. The title is Early Detection and Minimally Invasive Management of Complications Reduces Mortality After Pancreatic Resection, a nationwide Porsche trial. And the presenter is uh, Dr. Ann Claire Henry and uh, she is from the Medical Center at Etruck in the Netherlands. First, I want to thank you for the chance to present our work here. I would like to share with you the results of the PORS trial, a nationwide step wedge cluster randomized trial to early recognition and management of complications after pancreatic resection. This trial was designed and conducted by the Dutch Pancreatic Cancer Group. As known, around half of the patients that underwent pancreatic resection faces a complication. The most common is pancreatic fistula, resulting in intra-abdominal leakage of amylase-rich fluid. This may lead to life-threatening consequences, such as sepsis, severe bleeding, and multiple organ failure. Mortality in patients with clinically relevant pancreatic fistula is 12 to 18%. It has been suggested that focus for improving outcomes should include timely recognition and management of these complications. Therefore, the aim of this study is to evaluate if the implementation of a multi-model algorithm for early detection and minimally invasive management of pancreatic fistula after pancreatic resection results in a lower rate of major complications and death as compared to current practice. From January 2018 to 2019, uh, November, the nationwide step wedge cluster randomized PORS trial was conducted. All centers delivered usual care at the start of the study, the control group in blue, and crossed over to the intervention group in orange, in which patients were treated according to the algorithm. This happened in a randomly assigned order. The primary outcome was a composite of the most severe post-operative complications after pancreatic resection, bleeding requiring invasive intervention, new onset organ failure, and death during admission or 90 days after resection. Analysis were performed according to the intention to treat principle, comparing patients assigned to usual care with patients assigned to algorithm-centered care. Binary outcomes were analyzed using a mixed effects logistic regression analysis, adjusted for study design, hospital and calendar time, and adjusted for baseline variables associated with a high risk of pancreatic fistula or the primary endpoint. Time to event analysis were performed using a Cox pro proportional hazard regression analysis, and count data were analyzed using a zero inflated binomial regression model. Evaluation through the algorithm was carried out for each patient daily from day three to day 14 after resection. The first part of the algorithm focuses on early recognition of complications through standardized evaluation of vital signs, abdominal drain output, and biochemical inflammatory markers. If predefined cutoff values were exceeded, abdominal computed tomography was indicated. Evaluation of CT was standardized, focusing on radiologic signs of post-operative pancreatic fistula or other complications. In addition, the algorithm provides advice on antibiotic treatment and drain removal. In total, 1,805 patients were included, divided in 885 patients in the control group receiving usual care, care versus 863 patients in the intervention group who were treated according to the algorithm. Half of the patients was male, aged around 65 years of age. Um, most of the patients suffered from ASA classification zero to one, and the pancreatic duct was three versus four millimeters 
in the intervention group. 75% of all procedures involved a pancreatoduodenectomy. These baseline variables in orange are associated with a high risk of pancreatic fistula or the primary endpoint and are therefore corrected in the adjusted analysis. The primary composite endpoint decreased from 14.0% in the control group to 8.5% in the intervention group. New onset organ failure decreased from 10.4% to 4.5% in the intervention group, as was for all individual uh, organ systems. Bleeding requiring invasive intervention decreased from 5.8 to 5.4%. Although not st statistically different, the odds ratio of 0.64 may suggest an effect. And in conclusion, last but not least, the 90-day nationwide mortality decreased from 5.0 to 2.7%. All pancreatectomy-specific complications were comparable between both study groups. The patients in the intervention group were less often admitted to the intensive care unit compared to the control group, 6.6 versus 9.0%. The length of hospital stay remained the same, 10 and 11 days in total. It appeared that abdominal CT and radiologic drainage were performed both more often and earlier in the intervention group when compared to the control group. An average of 1.8 CT scan per patient in the intervention group was performed against 1.3 CT scan per patient in the control group. The first CT scan took place on day five in the intervention group and on day seven in the control group. An average of 0.5 drainage procedures per patient were performed in both study arms. The first radiologic drainage procedure took place on day eight in the intervention group versus day nine in the control group. In conclusion, this randomized trial demonstrated that the use of a novel algorithm for early detection and minimally invasive management of pancreatic fistula after pancreatic resection considerably improved clinical outcomes. This included an approximate 50% reduction of mortality nationwide. Thank you for your attention. Okay, this paper is open for discussion. We'll see if we can get our speaker on virtually. If not, I'm happy to field any questions. <laughs> Is she there? Very good. Okay. Um, I have a question about your primary outcomes. Um, at one point, you said the primary outcome was like the incidence of the um, fistulas, but then another place you said that the primary outcomes was the composite of the bleeding, invasive innervation, you know, an organ failure um, with the 90-day mortality. Could you clarify what the primary endpoint was in the study? And if there was, I know you showed one slide about the fistula formation, what the difference was there. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the for the question. Um, the primary endpoint is a composite of bleeding requiring invasive intervention, uh, death, and new onset organ failure. And one of the secondary out uh, um, outcomes is uh, the pancreatic fistula. And I have a question, uh, a small one. The pancreatic resection uh, also results in a long-term mesocrine and endocrine insufficiency. Uh, do you have any comment on that? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Uh, uh, endocrine and ex exocrine insufficiency for the long time. So is there any comment on that? Um, that's an interesting one. We did not focus on that part uh, of the post-operative uh, course, but we do have the data. So maybe um, for, uh, for next uh, research, we will uh, take this into consideration. And in your cohorts, uh, they were all 
uh, managed with minimally invasive drainage, I presume, did any of them have to go back to surgery? And if so, were they dropped from the study? Was that an early stopping point? Um, that was not an early stopping point, um, but we did see that in the intervention group, uh, way less uh, uh, re-operation was um, performed. So um, almost all patients were treated with the minimally invasive drainage, and we did not see any complications on, on that. And only in a few uh, patients uh, after drainage, uh, also a re-operation was needed, but uh, I don't have the details on that data. And what are your plans moving forward with this algorithm? Uh, we incorporated this algorithm in a smartphone application, uh, which can be widely used also abroad, so not only in the Netherlands. And with this uh, smartphone application, it is way more easier to use the algorithm. So in, in Holland, most of the pancreatic centers are, are already uh, making use of it. So in a couple of weeks, it will become available to download in the app stores. And furthermore, we will um, uh, further analyze the concept and um, maybe design a Porsche 2 algorithm, which might be more lean. So we, we are constantly developing this, but uh, at the moment it has already um, been used. Are there any other questions from the audience? We have a question. Um. Hi. Hi. Um, unfortunately, the question isn't for, for you. It's for the moderators, if you don't mind. Um, could something like that be easily implemented in the United States? Are clinical staff allowed to make use of smartphone apps and decision making? Is that something we could do here? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think that that would be great if it could be implemented, you know, and using a a support group like the Pancreas Society or the Surgical Society, I think that it could move forward here too. Um, there are certain, you know, societies that you can do the standard recommendations and they can be published in journals and become standard recommendations for the monitoring of these patients. But, but it would take it would take a little bit of time. Normal 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 academic process of moving from something that exists to Care. Technically, it could be done, yeah, and and it's just you know getting people to do it. That's the main thing. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We would be happy to um, support the use of the algorithm in the United States. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. So we are uh, moving on to next presentation. Uh, the presenter, Emily Green from Emory University School of Medicine. The title of the talk is Crosstalk Between Cancer Associated Fibroblast Soluble Mediators and Pancreatic Cancer Cells Facilitate an Invasive Phenotype. Looking forward to your talk. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the APA for giving me the opportunity to present some of my work to you today. My name is Emily Green, and I'm a graduate student in the Lozinski Lab at Emory University. And today I'd like to talk to you about one of the stories that I've been working on related to soluble factors from cancer-associated fibroblasts and their role in PDAC's ability to invade. As I'm sure this audience is aware, soluble factors from PDAC tumor microenvironment are known to influence many critical characteristics of these tumors. These soluble factors are produced by cancer cells themselves, immune cells, and the fibroblasts. Up to 90% of the primary tumor can consist of fibroblasts, indicating a critical role in these tumors and will be the focus of this talk. We hypothesize that soluble factors from CAFs promote crosstalk between PDAC cells to facilitate phenotypic changes that contribute to invasion leading to metastatic behavior. To evaluate the direct effects of CAF-produced soluble factors on PDAC invasion, primary CAFs were isolated from resected PDAC surgical tissue using a well-established culture method. 
and fibroblasts were characterized by morphology and IF staining of stromal markers, including vimentin, GFIP, and alpha smooth muscle actin. Normal fibroblasts and PANK1 cancer cells were also stained as controls. Supernatants were then collected every seven days and stored until use. To evaluate the effects of these soluble factors on invasion, we utilized a 3D spheroid invasion assay using the HPAC cell line. Embedded spheroids were exposed to 10% primary calf condition media and imaged every 24 hours. Invasion was quantified using circularity and roundness measurements on Fiji ImageJ software. This graphic helps to illustrate these values. Values that are less than one indicate invasion. This set of images illustrates how the spheroid exhibit an invasive phenotype when exposed to calf conditioned media. Embedded HPAC spheroids exposed to conditioned media from two different primary calf samples are compared to DMEM uh, media alone. As you can see, spheroids become more elongated and develop protrusions over the course of 72 hours when exposed to calf conditioned media, whereas the control spheroids remain mostly spherical. When using Fiji to quantify the invasion of these spheroids, the y-axis uh, represents circularity measurements of these spheroids, where the values less than one represent invasion, and each condition is represented on the x-axis. Here, I'm comparing three different primary calf supernatants to a media control. We see that calf condition media significantly increases the invasion of these spheroids into the matrix, indicating that soluble factors from the calves play a critical role in this phenotype. During these previously described experiments, we noticed an unusual invasion pattern exhibited from these spheroids. This live cell imaging video shows the invasion pattern of an HPAC spheroid exposed to primary calf condition media over 72 hours. I'd like to draw your attention to the, um, the invading sheet-like phenotype that we observe and draw your attention to the cell labeled with the blue dot that emerges towards the bottom of the screen. I'm gonna let this play through one more time. Um, this cell and a few others like it exhibit a phenotype that we've termed as a sheepdog-like cell, where these cells seem to detach from the mass and appear to be guiding or shepherding the invading cells through the matrix. Um, with, our, with help from our collaborators in the Marcus Lab at Emory, we're now working on developing a spatial temporal genomic and cellular analysis or SAGA workflow to uh, better study these sheepdog cells. Using a photo convertible Dendra 2 gene construct, we've been able to label the HPAC cells with stably expressing green fluorescence. Here I'm showing a 2D monolayer of the Dendra 2 expressing cells as an illustration. Using a 405 nanometer laser, we're able to photo convert cells of interest, such as our sheepdog cells, from green to red. These spheroids are then dissociated into a single cell suspension and sorted based on their color expression, green for the bulk of the cells and red for the sheepdog cells of interest. We will then perform sequencing analysis to compare gene expression profiles between the bulk spheroid population and the sheepdog cell population. To begin to narrow down the source of this invasive phenotype, we took a biochemical approach and boiled the primary calf supernatants prior to exposing spheroids with conditioned media. This significantly reduced invasion of exposed spheroids. These data suggest that potentially a protein or proteins are responsible for this invasive phenotype as the boiling would disrupt protein structure of the, invading, or of the um, inducing invading factor. In an attempt to identify, identify soluble factors that may be responsible for this phenotype, primary calf supernatants were evaluated by bioplex analysis. Um, these calf supernatants are compared to, an H, to the HPAC cell um, supernatant as a comparator. Uh, each soluble factor is listed across the top of the heat map, and I'd like to draw your attention to some of the more interesting results from this analysis. I've highlighted factors that are upregulated in the calf samples compared to the cancer cell line. These factors serve as potential mediators for the invasive phenotype and will be evaluated further in um, future experiments. So in conclusion, um, we have shown that exposure of primary calf condition media increases invasion of HPAC cells. We've also observed that um, spheroids invade in a sheet-like sheet 
pattern and a unique group of sheepdog cells seem to move independently and rapidly at the invasive edge, potentially guiding the massive cells through the matrix. We believe that the inducing factor or factors involved are protein in nature as boiling the primary calf supernatants abrogated this invasive phenotype. And finally, we have preliminary data that uh, depicts potential soluble mediators of this phenotype. Um, our current and future directions, um, we are actively working on the saga experiment that I previously described to evaluate, um, and hopefully we'll be able to evaluate uh, the sequencing data for potential druggable targets. Um, we intend to explore the factors of interest from the Bioplex data to, ev to evaluate their individual contribution to invasion, as well as their effects on immune cell population and function, which is another um, project that I'm working on. Uh, we are also working on replicating this invasive phenotype with multiple PDAC cell lines. Um, I've only described one to you today, but we are working on others. And then uh, we also intend to uh, evaluate contact dependent mechanisms of invasion by evaluating heterospheroids uh, containing uh, both calf and cancer cells. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank my PI, Greg Lisinski, who's here today. Um, my lab mates, both past and present, our many collaborators at Emory and elsewhere that have helped contribute to this work, our core facilities and funding sources. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the patients and their families for participating in our clinical trials that make our work possible. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm gonna let the video play while I take questions. Um. Thank you, Emily. Uh, open for discussion. Do you have any questions? Hi. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, cool. Oh, God. Hi, I'm Maria Monberg, MD yes. Anderson. Um, quick question. Yes. Simple question. What, um, what major genetic are you guys using? So we've tried a few different um, matrix gels just to compare. Uh, the data that I'm showing you is based on just a collagen matrix. Um, so, okay, well, I was, I was just wondering because like, I, I work with a lot of organoid models and mm -hmm. sometimes depending on the growth factors, you can see different invasion phenotypes. Yeah. I was just curious how that was kind of playing along with, with the work you're up to. Yeah, that's one of the things that we thought about. We wanted to limit the, the model as much as possible mm -hmm. um, so that the only thing that these cancer cells are really being exposed to is whatever is coming from those calf supernatants. Mm -hmm. So that's why we chose to just go with a collagen matrix because there's no additional growth factors like you would find in a matrix gel. Cool. And then one other question yes. I'm wondering um, for your future directions, it yes. looks like you're planning some cool cultures. Are you guys kind of going to look to phase um, different proportions of, of fibroblast in your cells with cancer cells and kind of see it? At, I don't know, at what point you really start to see some serious interactions going on or? Yeah, so we've actually already started these studies. Um, I don't have time to talk about them today, um, but we are looking at uh, multiple ratios. Um, so anything from you know a one to one ratio up to like a one to nine to better recapitulate what the tumor might actually look like if you're thinking 90% fibroblasts. Um, and then the flip side of that as well. So if you have you know less fibroblasts in that, co-culture what happens wow. so yeah there's a, a pretty wide range that we're evaluating awesome thank you so much yeah um, i have a question so uh is there any um early on not on the invasive phenotype uh in panning stage probably if you look at the soluble factors is going to change mm -hmm. um right um so I, I can't really speak to that. I know, so all I can say is that the surgical tissue that all of these casts were derived from were Whipple samples, um, but I don't have, at least off the top, we have it um, in the lab, like written down. Um, I'm a little blinded to it at the moment, um, but we do have the data to show like at what stage these patients were when that was resected. Um, so we can go back and look at, you know, how early or how late, um, that surgical tissue was resected, but I don't have that information off the top of my head for these samples. Uh, I saw the IL-6 and LIF, you know, they are, mm -hmm. is the, they are, in, did you characterize any of them for the anti, anti-tumor anti immunity or any, any, uh, any role on those uh, soluble factors involved in? Yeah, so we've just kind of started evaluating the individual soluble factors. Um, 
again, didn't have time to present that work today. Um, but those are, I would say IL-6 and LIF are probably the, like the top of our list sure. to evaluate. Um, and then we'll probably go through the rest of them sequentially. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so I have a technical question. Yes. So when you take these specimens from your patients with a Whipple mm -hmm. and you isolate the calves or the fibroblast, you put them, I presume, in a plastic dish, you do. Yes. which may activate mm -hmm. them. Okay. And do you add TGF bait or anything else to activate them or you just let them be themselves? No, all okay. we do is put them in media with, um, with FBS and let them grow. Um, and then you take the meat, the supernatant from them to track. Yes. Okay. And can you measure um, micro RNAs also? Is that a possibility since they're known to be secreted? Mm -hmm. um, they don't have to be secreted in exosomes, but they might cross talk. Yes. So this is a, a conversation that we've had in the lab. Um, this is part of our future directions. We want to evaluate, you know, there's other things that are secreted by calves. I'm focusing on um, more immune modulatory uh, factors um, at the moment, but that is an, uh, obviously another factor that could very well be critical and is on our list of things to do with these super maintenance to evaluate if there's any microRNAs. And, and with some of your hits that you got like eotexin or whatever, mm -hmm. is there a way to um, maybe knock out those receptors on your cells and see if maybe they don't respond? Yeah, um, so that would be one way to do it. Um, we're, I think we're going, we're starting our evaluation by just adding recombinant um, individual factors to evaluate invasive properties. Um, if we get hits, the next step is to then knock out the receptor and see if that abrogates the effect. Mm -hmm. and, and since macrophages also play an important role, is that part of your co-culture experiments planned coming up? It's not part of the plan at the moment, um, but we could always add that in. Um, it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, great. Thank you, thank you, Emily. No other questions? There's some more oh, questions, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't see. This is from, oh, hi, my name is Owen from Georgetown. So we know that cats exist in a heterogeneous population, and I noticed some of the factors indicate that these might be more high calves versus my calves. So how do you distinguish between which calf supernatant is associated with this phenotype if it's more associated with ones that are from my calves versus my calves? Have you made that distinction? So um, we, when we did uh, some of the IF staining, we do know that these calves stain for both alpha SMA and um, IL-6, indicating that they probably are more I-calf, which makes sense since we're growing them on plastic. Um, so, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Great talk, Emily. Uh, so, University of Miami. How did you go about um, sort of quantifying and identifying the soluble factors or, or the cytokines? Was it like, you know, you knew which one to go for or is it, was it kind of a screen? That's we did a screening. So we did a bioplex screen of um, 71 factors, I believe. Um, and these were just some of the top hits that I'm presenting to you today. Can I ask which, what, what was that? If, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, find me afterwards and I can get you what it was. Uh, and second question was, uh, what about if you look at the other way around? So instead of the factors being released from caps, mm -hmm. uh, you switch it up and uh, start putting in the conditioned media from the tumor epithelial cells onto that. Like, is that, I know uh, some research has been in that direction already. And David <laughs> Tuvison, I, I think he's not in with us at the moment, but what, what, what is your take on that? Um, I think it's a, it's a great experiment. Um, I don't know if it will be included into this paper. Um, that could be a whole nother like topic, um, but it's kind of the flip side of that coin, right? Like there, there's crosstalk between these cells in the tumor microenvironment. We're looking at a very isolated, uh, an isolated experiment um, for the purpose of strictly evaluating what happens coming from the calves to the cancer cells. But the same question can be asked in reverse. What happens when you have calves and they're receiving signals from the cancer cells? Does that change their phenotype? The answer is probably yes. 
but I don't have that data to, to talk to right now. Great work. Thank you. Thank you, Vineet. Uh, quick. Hi. Hi, my name is Vineet from University of Miami. Uh, great talk. I'm more curious about the sheep, sheep dog cells. Mm -hmm. uh, did you try to put them back into organoids again and see does like this transition is temporary or like a permanent kind of thing? Does they grow like how does they behave? So that's one of our main questions about these cells. Um, and that's why we're going to be doing the saga analysis. Mm -hmm. um, we have the ability to sort out these cells and not just do the transcriptomic analysis, but we're also planning on sorting them out, culturing them separately, and then kind of either um, doing spheroids where we only use the bulk cells that didn't exhibit that previous phenotype or adding those cells back in as their own spheroid and do they all just go crazy? Um, so these are questions I don't have answers to at the moment, but they are things that I will be working on as soon as I get back to the lab. Um, so hopefully I'll have those answers very shortly. For Thank you. you. Looking forward to your data again. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Um, our third speaker today, uh, the title is Next Generation Sequencing of Pancreatic Cis Fluid is Sensitive and Specific for the Classification and Detection of Advanced Neoplasia in Mucinous Cis, a Prospective Multi-Institutional Study. And our presenter is Dr. Allison Richardson from Stanford University. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to my mentors and collaborators for the opportunity to present this work and in particular Dr. Singhi for his leadership on this project. Here are my disclosures. Pancreatic cysts are commonly encountered in clinical practice, especially with the increased use and advancements in radiographic imaging. In fact, it is estimated that around 3% of the general population has a pancreatic cyst. And half of these cysts are mucinous and include IPMNs or interductal papillary mucinous neoplasms or MCNs, mucinous cystic neoplasms, which are precursors to pancreatic cancer. Not surprisingly, upon the identification of a pancreatic cyst, a standard assessment involves a multidisciplinary approach including clinical presentation, imaging, as well as cyst aspiration for cytologic analysis. However, all of these modalities have their limitations in the identification of pancreatic cysts and early detection of pancreatic cancer. That being said, in the past few years, there has been some exciting research in the field of pancreatic cysts that has emerged from whole exome sequencing and targeted DNA sequencing studies. Many of these studies have found distinct mutational profiles among the major pancreatic cysts that are highly specific for cyst type and can be identified using a small amount of pancreatic cyst fluid. For instance, IPMNs are known to have mutations in KRAS and GNAS, whereas serous cyst adenomas have VHL alterations, and non-neoplastic cysts are devoid of any of the above mutations. However, not all mucinous cysts progress to pancreatic cancer. For IPMNs, despite refinements in pancreatic cyst guidelines, there are still issues with sensitivity and specificity in predicting malignancy. However, gene sequencing studies have identified recurrent alterations in the genes P53, SMAD4, and the mTOR pathway that are frequently associated with high-grade dysplasia and invasive cancer. Okay, no worries. Perfect. Such that now we have a list of genes that characterize both mucinous cysts and their malignant potential. 
But unfortunately, these genes have not been comprehensively tested prospectively and among multiple institutions, and therefore the aim and goal of our study. We created a targeted next generation sequencing panel to evaluate 22 pancreatic cyst related genes. This panel known as pancreas seek was offered to gastroenterologists throughout the United States. And over in this study, over a two year period, we analyzed close to 2000 patients from 31 institutions in real time with a seven to 10 day turnaround. And among the number of observations made in this study, we found a little more than half of the pancreatic cysts harbored not only alterations in RAS and GNAS genes, but also a high prevalence of non V600E BRAF mutations. And these BRAF alterations or mutations were frequently associated with the clinical impression of an IPMN. In addition, approximately 10% of these RAS BRAF and GNAS mutant cysts harbored alterations in our high-risk genes, P53, SMAD4, mTOR, and interestingly, CTNNB1 or beta-catenin. However, these findings needed to be correlated with diagnostic surgical pathology. And among our 200 patient panel, around 18% or 251 underwent surgical resection. This included 186 mucinous cysts and 60 non-mucinous cysts. Correlating mutations in KRAS, GNAS, and BRAF that were detected preoperatively. We found alterations in these genes had a 90% sensitivity and 100% specificity for mucinous cysts. In comparison, both the assessment of fluid viscosity or the string sign and the presence of elevated CEA had both lower sensitivity and specificity for either an IPMN or an MCN. Interestingly, mutations in TP in P53, SMAD4, CTNNB1, and the mTOR genes were also associated with high sensitivity and high specificity for high grade, grade dysplasia and invasive adenocarcinoma or advanced neoplasia. That once again demonstrated superior performance to other diagnostic modalities that included both cytology and high risk imaging findings. And statistically, the highest sensitivity of detecting advanced neoplasia within a mucinous cyst was achieved when combining both pancreatic testing and cytology. And this is also able to maintain a high specificity. So in summary, through a multi-institutional prospective study, we believe we have demonstrated the application of DNA sequencing to pancreatic cyst fluid and its utility in the preoperative classification of pancreatic cysts and early detection of pancreatic cancer. The detection of KRAS, GNAS, and or BRAF mutations was both highly sensitive and highly specific for mucinous pancreatic cysts. And additionally, genomic alterations in P53, SMAD4, CTNNB1, and the mTOR genes displayed superior performance to other diagnostic modalities the detection of advanced neoplasia within a mucinous cyst. However, all this being said, it's important to note that pancreas seek is not meant to replace routine assays or a multidisciplinary approach, but rather should be used in conjunction. In fact, in our study, we found the highest sensitivity for the detection of, uh, of um, advanced neoplasia in a mucinous cyst was achieved when combining both cytology and pancreas seek testing. But all of this being said, certainly we have several more questions that remain in regards to pancreas seek testing and tests like it. For instance, who do we test? When should we test them? And how do we integrate the molecular findings into the currently established guidelines? And finally, who's going to pay for it in an ever-changing landscape of medical insurance providers? All important questions to consider as we continue to move forward in the field of pancreatic cysts. Thank you. This paper's open for discussion. There's some questions. (laughs) 
Hello, uh, Marta from MD Anderson. Very nice talk. I was wondering if you had the chance to look at the low grade ICMN samples and see if in a small cohort of those you were already seeing these mutations. Um, because it seems like this, you know, what you're already detecting is already at the high grade stage. And so it would be great if when there's still low grades, you could, um, you know, you could identify the ones that have like malignant potential. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I definitely, we definitely have those patients in our cohort. Um, and I do know that, you know, when we looked at IPMNs with low grade dysplasia, they definitely had absence of the high grade and high risk uh, alterations. Um, but I'm not sure right now if, if those also had additional separate mutational profiles. Thank you. Hi, great talk. Um, quick question. I'm wondering, so just making sure I didn't miss anything, you're doing everything in the cyst fluid, right? Correct. Correct. Um, do you guys have any plans to do any comparisons with uh, sequencing of like cyst wall biopsies or tissue sections from, from that and kind of look into see, um, you know, if there are differences or any type of good comparative analysis you can do between the fluid and the tissue? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think important to highlight that this is for cyst fluid and in particular for side branch IPMNs and is less useful for main duct and solid lesions. So I'm not sure um, if that's in the pipeline, but it's certainly a great thing to explore. Okay, yeah, sorry, thanks. And do you ever, um, have you noticed any difference in the people that are like borderline as far as the imaging features that this might help to just, you know, differentiate which people you need to uh, move forward with, like if their cyst is less than three centimeters or you didn't see a mural nodule, but you know, you do detect this, would that be useful? Yeah, I think that's our hope for the future. Um, definitely this study didn't particularly address like whether it influenced the decision to go to surgery and all these patients that we ultimately analyzed did go to surgery and it's sort of can be a bias of our sample, but I think that is the hope that given all of the, the modalities and multidisciplinary approach, can we add this as another tool to know for those borderline cases? Um, just a positive, uh, it's not a question. I think now we have a tool and the specific gene alterations to predict the malignancy from the cis. That's a, thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions, we thank you for your presentation. Moving on to the uh, next presenter, um, uh, Leah Kaplan from Vanderbilt University. Uh, the title of the talk is Enteroendocrine Cell Formation is an Early Event in Pancreatic Tumorigenesis. Thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to present my work. Again, my name is Leah Kaplan. I'm a graduate student in Kathy Del Giorno's lab at Vanderbilt. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about some of our work uh, looking at endocrine cell formation as an early event in tumorigenesis. So as we are all well aware, uh, pancreatic cancer is a devastating disease, yet how it forms is not well understood. Uh, one way in which pancreatic cancer can form is through acinar to ductal metaplasia, which is a uh, injury response program of the, of the pancreas in which acinar cells undergo transdifferentiation into ductal-like cells. And so my work focuses more on these early events in tumorigenesis. So our lab recently published a paper in gastro looking at ADM uh, cell type heterogeneity in pancreatitis. And so uh, here's just a workflow of what we did. Uh, we used lineage tracing of acinar cells using an acinar specific pre to turn on yellow fluorescent protein uh, using tamoxifen injection, and then using a common C commonly used CKK analog, uh, cerulean, we induced pancreatitis for two and four weeks. And then we took that tissue for histological analysis and also isolated YFP positive cells for single cell analysis. So what we found from this analysis is uh, interesting ADM-derived cell type heterogeneity, 
uh, and also interestingly was this enteroendocrine cell population that has not previously been described in ADM. And so upon further analysis of, of this population, we see heterogeneity of different cell types based off of uh, differentiated cell types based off of their hormone expression. And you can see in this table here, uh, just the different cells that we identified based off the hormone expression. So uh, epsilon cells express ghrelin, enterochromaffin cells express serotonin, gamma cells pancreatic polypeptide, and delta cells somatostatin. So how do these findings in pancreatitis relate to PDAC? So as I showed you just a second ago, that these hormones that we found in our uh, ADM-derived cell type analysis. Uh, these are hormones expressed by enteroendocrine cells that are present normally in other organs of the GI tract. And so these hormones have different physiological functions, such as modulating secretion of insulin or uh, other factors, as well as uh, aiding in gut motility. But uh, the role of these hormones in cancer is either different, new, or in the context of PPY is, is unknown. And so this suggests just context dependent effects of these hormones uh, in different processes. And so we are interested in when these enteroendocrine cells arise in, uh, in tumorigenesis and what is the role of these hormones in this process. So to look at when these cells arise in tumorigenesis, we used a KC and KPC mouse models. Uh, we stained these tissues for synaptophysin, which is a pan enteroendocrine cell marker. We took these tissues uh, we had a pathologist grade the lesions, and then we counted and analyzed the percentage of synaptophysin positive cells per lesion, and we did this for over 1,300 lesions. And so you can see here that, and for both KC and KPC mice, that overwhelmingly there is an increase in synaptophysin positive cells in metaplasia, and it significantly decreases as lesion grade prog progresses. And below is just some representative IHC from our KPC mice. So as I showed you earlier that we identified uh, heterogeneity of this population. And so we looked at the distribution of these cell types in our KC and KPC mouse tissue. And so here we stain for serotonin, ghrelin, somatostatin, and PPY. And you can see the same trends as they're more highly expressed in metaplasia. My laser won't reach the other two. Uh, and significantly decreases with increasing lesion grade. And below are some representative IHC images of serotonin in the KPC mice. And so uh, the data that I've shown you so far show, uh, shows that these enteroendocrine cells are present in a much higher percentage in these early grade lesions, significantly decreases as lesion grade progresses, and that these cells are heterogeneous. So next we were interested, are these hormones uniquely expressed or is there co-expression? And here we stained, we use multiplex immunofluorescence to stain um, or the six month KC tissue. And the majority of hormone combinations showed little to no co-localization of, of antibody staining. And here is just some representative multiplex IF of serotonin somatostatin, uh, where most of our hormone combinations just didn't show a lot of overlap. And here of 300 positive cells of serotonin, uh, very few were, well, one was present for somatostatin and of 300 somatostatin, uh, none were co-positive for serotonin. Alternatively, some hormone combinations did show a lot of co-localization. And here you can see representative multiplex IF of somatostatin and PPY in which 300 of the somatostatin positive cells were 81% uh, were co-positive for PPY and almost 48 were co-positive of PPY were co-positive for somatostatin. So uh, this could possibly be due, this percentage of overlap could be due to uh, enteroendocrine cell lineage trajectory or possibly an ADM specific subtype. And so next uh, we were interested in, in looking at these cells in human. And so two papers have noted enteroendocrine cells in human panin and PDAC. However, they did not look at the heterogeneity of these cells. And so here that's what we did. And uh, we stained for ghrelin and somatostatin shown here as well as PPY and serotonin. And while this analysis is still preliminary, we do see the same trends that we saw in the mouse tissue that these hormones are more highly expressed in ADM. The trend is that they decrease as lesion grade increases. But interestingly, we see that PPY seems to have an, uh, a second peak in invasive adenocarcinoma, really highlighting that the effect of these hormones is context dependent and uh, requires further study. 
And so here is just a graphical depiction of the information that I've shown you so far that enteroendocrine cell formation is an early event in tumor genesis and arises in metaplasia and that these cell types are heterogeneous. And so future directions that we plan to do are to knock out this lineage and study the effect of the absence of these cells in tumor genesis, as well as to functionally characterize the role of these hormones in, in, these, uh, in this process. And so with that, I'd like to thank my lab, my mentor, Kathy, uh, Vera, and Vincent for grading a lot of tissue, and David for counting even more tissue, um, and my funders uh, for supporting this work. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Great work, Leah. Uh, thank you. Uh, open for discussion. Uh, I'll ask a question while people are coming up. So these uh, peptides get activated during ADM, but then they're shut off later on. So, or they're decreased. And so do you know what shuts them off and is KRAS involved? And, and the other question is, is their expression um, is it a causation of the effect to go on to develop panins or are they just coincidental because they're activated from the inflammation in the ADM? Okay, so your first question, <laughs> um, looking at uh, just kind of the proportions. So uh, right now, the data that I have just shows more of the, the proportions. We're not so much looking at the causality yet. <clears throat> Uh, but that is an interesting direction to look to see is, is there causal effect in one direction versus the other? Mm -hmm. um, and then your second question was, uh, can you re repeat that please? The second question was the one that you answered about causation versus ah. coincidence. Um, <clears throat> but is, is KRAS the reason that they get shut off? Because in your other system, it, there's no KRAS. So does KRAS play a role in turning them off so that you don't see their expression later on? Uh, I do not know the role of KRAS in this, but we are looking at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do see these cells in higher grade lesions, just at a significantly lower proportion. And uh, as we saw with the human data that they are in cancer. So uh, a lot of room for, for further study there. Question? Hi, free talk, we'll go A2 bio. You actually stole my question, causation versus correlation. <laughs> But uh, I'm going to try to expand on that then, uh, but not just KRAS, but how about the other other markers in terms of an inflammatory or otherwise that you are going to expand into that? And if so, how are you going to do that? Yes. Yeah, so we are interested in looking into like what are the functional roles of these hormones and at the different stages of tumorigenesis. Uh, we do have some experiments in mind, uh, but this work is still preliminary and uh, we'll do that as soon as I can <laughs> back in lab. Great. Good morning, uh, Fred Gorlick, New Haven. That's really a very interesting presentation. I was wondering if these might cells, well, in the gut there, often have uh, receptors on them for metabolic products, such as taste net receptors or pH sensors. And I'm wondering if there could be signaling from the cancer cells to the, uh, the uh, intraendocrine uh, cells populations. Have you looked? for tastant or pH receptors on these populations of cells? I haven't looked at those yet. Uh, there is a paper that looks at um, these cells and that uh, when they saw more um, synaptophysin staining in the inhuman tumor samples, uh, they actually had a worse or more chemo resistance, so a worse response to chemo. So there probably is some crosstalk. I don't know exactly what that is, but definitely interested in finding out um, those different different communication lines. Hello. So great talk. Oops, this is not working, is it? Okay, now it is. So I was wondering how you relate your findings to the fact that actually most of these hormones are produced naturally by pancreatic islets, and also how going forward you will distinguish between, you know, the ones that arise and the early stages of cancer versus the ones that are always around in the islets of Lancaster. Because I mean, yeah, they're all being produced normally anyway. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, Delta and uh, also the Delta cells secrete somatostatin and PPY are in islets, but PPY is usually expressed pretty lowly. Um, there is some different, uh, there's a lot of changes that happen. I'm not an islet biologist, but I do see a lot of oh, yeah, changes. 
Uh, <laughs> um, I do see a lot of changes to the islets in both the cancer models as well as the, uh, the patient samples. And um, so through lineage tracing, we can look to see, and, and that's what we did in the paper that we recently published, that these cells were not islet derived, they were derived from the Asner cells. Um, I'm sure of that. I just think that the role of those hormones, you know, those hormones are always around. They're just, they might be from a different source. And mm -hmm. then targeting the lineage might be fired without affecting the islet. So it yeah. depends. And one thing that I'm interested in figuring out is, are these uh, hormones secreted or is there also some cell to cell mm -hmm. contact and, and with interendocrine cells, that is one major way that they do function. And, and just from looking at a bunch of images and where the cells are placed and as well as EM data as well, there are some interesting things I think going on there as to what they are actually communicating with. And, uh, but to figure out a way to separate those two is an important thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, last question, Leah, uh, from me. Uh, is EEC subtypes and the pan in neuroendocrine cells have any similarities in disease progression? But the both are in early on. So, uh, so neuroendocrine cells and enteroendocrine cells, they, from my understanding, they they share a lot of similar features. There are differences, but they share a lot of similar features. Um, the two papers that have looked into them previously have used markers that could be used for enteroendocrine cell or panin. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first time that we've looked at that. It, the heterogeneity has been looked at, um, but definitely to see if there are differences or maybe there's some different uh, differences between enteroendocrine cells and neuroendocrine cells is an important distinction if, if that's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next paper is a virtual presentation, uh, pancreatic cancer detection using epigenomic and genomic signatures in plasma-derived cell-free DNA in high-risk patients with new onset diabetes. And the presenter is Dr. Anna Bergamashi uh, from Blue Star Genomics. Good morning. In the next seven minutes, I will share with you Blue Star's pancreatic cancer test and its application in new onset diabetes. Pancreatic cancer has extremely low five-year survival rates, specifically when the disease is already metastasized. On the other hand, for localized disease, it can reach 40%. Unfortunately, for the vast majority of patients, it is diagnosed when it's already metastasized, robbing patients of better treatment options and significantly hindering patient outcomes. While pancreatic cancer early detection is a major unmet medical need, due to its low incidence rate, screening is recommended in high-risk groups rather than in the general asymptomatic population. 25% of uh, pancreatic cancer patients have a recent diabetes diagnosis that predates cancer diagnosis by about three years. Among the 1 million patients who are diagnosed with diabetes annually, one in 100 will go on to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer within three years. Despite this six to eight fold elevated risk, there's currently no standard of care to evaluate the new onset diabetes patients for pancreatic cancer. We aim to change this with the Blue Star Pancreatic Cancer Test. Our intent to test population is individuals with new onset diabetes who are over 50 years old, uh, from whom uh, blood is drawn by a simple venipuncture. Then the blood is processed to obtain plasma and subjected to Blue Star's 5-HMC assay in our CLIA lab uh, to extract cancer signatures that are enabled by machine learning to determine uh, whether signatures detected are indicative of pancreatic cancer. At the center of this process is DNA hydroxymethylation, preferred in short as 5-HMC. DNA hydroxymethylation is an epigenetic mark uh, that emerge upon processing of metal cytosines by the TET enzymes, which are responsible for uh, active demethylation. While methyl cytosines are associated in general with transcriptional suppression, hydroxymethylation is associated with transcriptionally poised or active regions. It is particularly enriched over regions that are specific to tissues and cellular states, whereas DNA methyl cytosine covers large regions of the genome for the purpose of suppression in all types of cells. 
Therefore, 5-HMC is highly enriched in disease-relevant signals with high signal-to-noise ratio, enabling biomarker detection at reduced cost. Pancreatic cancer detection is one of the areas we apply this technology. Our study comparing 5-HMC signatures to detect pancreatic cancer in plasma was published in 2020, and we received FDA breakthrough designation uh, earlier this, uh, this year in March. Here, I would like to share with you the results of our feasibility study where Blue Star test was applied to a prospective blood collection from 800 non-cancer controls and 117 pancreatic cancer patients from whom blood was collected at the time of diagnosis. Importantly, 49% of the pancreatic cancer cohort was early stage. Pancreatic cancer detection model was built using the training set and then applied to the independent validation set. In this validation set composed of independent samples that were not seen by the model before testing, the performance was 51.5% sensitivity and 97.5% specificity. Since the validation set contained both a NOD and non-NOD patients, we also evaluated the performance in the NOD-only subset and found the performance to be 46.7% sensitivity and 98% specificity. Assuming 1% pancreatic cancer incidence rate in the new onset diabetes population, this gives a PPV of 19%. Most importantly, sensitivity for early and late stage was comparable, where sensitivity subset to early stage cases in the validation set was 60%. Such early stage performance has the potential to improve patient outcomes by shifting the stage at which pancreatic cancer is detected. According to SEER data, which is shown in Salmon here, um, more than 50% of the new pancreatic cancers are detected at late stage. With the screening strategy in high-risk populations using Blue Star pancreatic test, um, our simulation results shown here in blue indicate that it can be possible to decrease late-stage detection from 63% to 38%. To conclude, I shared with you today Blue Star's test, which uses differences in hydroxymethylation profiles to detect pancreatic cancer in plasma. With this test, we aim to enable reduction in premature mortalities by shifting pancreatic cancer diagnosis to early stage. FDA granted a breakthrough designation for pancreatic cancer detection in new onset diabetes population in March this year, and CLIA test will be available early next year. We are currently setting up a clinical validation study, which will enroll 10,000 patients to start in uh, early 2022. With that, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions you may have. Um, it's my understanding, I think Dr. Golfim Guter is, no, is Anna taking the questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Questions? Um, great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you if uh, you could comment perhaps about the stability um, of the 5-HMC as compared to the other, other epigenetic marks. And what was the rationale behind 5-HMC considering other, you know, either a histone marks as well. Um, and, and as opposed to the methylation, which is mostly repressive by nature, I think, you were looking at what activation maybe? Is that, what, what was the rest? Um, so maybe yeah. that would be it. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's, uh, that's an excellent question. 5-HMC um, does mark regions. Um, so uh, kind of you, like you alluded to, um, unlike the metal cytosines, uh, which uh, for the majority uh, mark, uh, uh, transcription of suppressed regions, 5-HMC is associated with uh, active regions. So you end up detecting these um, active biology uh, and uh, it, it provides a very specific and uh, uh, 
uh, enriched uh, biomarker. And in terms of your uh, question, to address your question about stability, 5-HMC uh, can be transient in the process to uh, active demethylation, to full demethylation. However, uh, these marks uh, that uh, the regions that are marked for uh, tissue specificity and uh, relevant to disease, they are stable and we are uh, detecting them. Next question. Hi, Will Go, A2Bio. Uh, great work, great talk. Congratulations on the breakthrough therapy designation. Um, question in terms of an exploratory fashion, retrospectively, are you also going to be looking at circulating tumor DNA to increase the sensitivity after you do the training and validation sets in 2022? Um, so we um, so we are looking in the uh, in the in the cell-free DNA, uh, a portion of it is uh, from the circulating tumor DNA. So we are uh, indeed also looking at uh, ctDNA. Is that gonna be your potential plan to increase the sensitivity as well? Um, so, um, we, um, so currently uh, we are already looking at the ctDNA, but, but are you, uh, is your question related to doing some mutational type analysis? Yeah, it's just one way because the specificity looks very impressive. It's just to increase the sensitivity. And I'm just trying to ask, what are you trying to do to increase the sensitivity? Mm -hmm, I see. So um, we are, um, so, um, so our uh, efforts in like, we obviously like to increase uh, sensitivity is ongoing. Uh, but uh, with this performance uh, already, we believe this would uh, be an improvement since there is no uh, coverage, uh, especially for the early stage uh, detection. We need to ask last question here. Sure. Thank you. Very quickly, I assume you also looked at CA99 in those blood samples and how did it compare and did it add to it? And the second is, you know, this, these are great efforts to be applauded, of course, but you need a much higher specificity even than that, right? Because otherwise we're gonna identify signal and we're gonna be looking for things that we may not be able to find. Um, so, um, so to address the specificity uh, question, um, so our, um, the validation set um, allowed for uh, measurement up to 98%. So we actually have larger uh, validation studies that we will be uh, we are, uh, concluding that will that uh, indicates that we can reach a uh, higher uh, specificity, but, uh, and also um, the, uh, in terms of the false uh, positives. So this would be a, a screening type essay where, a positive signal would suggest a follow-up by, uh, you know, clinical um, preference of a beat uh, MRI um, to, to uh, finalize diagnosis. And you had a CA99, yes. Uh, so CA19, uh, we did uh, look into that, and, and actually, like in the in the paper that's referenced. So. Um, Basically, uh, there was um, uh, cases, uh, I mean, uh, the test outperformed, as you know, like the, the specificity is not great with CA19. Um, so there was uh, 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 the cases that were missed by CA19 could be picked up with this signal and uh, vice versa. The false uh, negatives, uh, false positives could be decreased also. Thank you so much for your interesting talk. And we hope that this will help us with our early onset diabetics. Um, thank, thank you. you. Moving on to the next presentation, uh, the presenter, Kulina Ganguly, uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center. The title of the talk is Mucin C Tunes mm -hmm. Adipose Mesenchymal Stem Cells to Reg Regulate Stromal Heterogeneity in uh, Pancreatic Cancer. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I would like to thank the AP committee for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work today. Uh, today, I'll be dis discussing about the role of a secreted mucin, MAC5AC, in mediating stromal heterogeneity in pancreatic cancer. 
Um, as we all know, pancreatic cancer is a very lethal malignancy, and one of the important factors that responsible for such a poor prognosis of this disease is the intense desmoplastic stroma that's uh, made up of the cancer-associated fibroblasts, immune cells, and the extracellular matrix proteins, and it comprises of 70 to 90 percent of the entire tumor volume, where the malignant cells are uh, technically the minor population. Um, so several groups over the last few years have studied the heterogeneity of these caps and they have found out that depending on the uh, expression of the stromal markers and their spatial organization in the tumor, these caps are different. However, the intricate molecular mechanisms that drive these heterogeneity is not yet uh, known. And we believe that maybe the cellular origin of these caps are responsible for uh, their heterogeneous nature. Um, and it's also known that the stromal development and oncogenesis are parallel events. And in this on oncogenic event, uh, mucins play a very important role. Uh, they can be divided into transmembrane and secreted mucins. And 5AC is the most abundant secreted mucin that's uh, not expressed in the norm normal pancreas. However, it starts expressing from a very early stage and its expression is maintained throughout the disease progression. And as you can see here, its ex expression recapitulates in the KC model, uh, which is a well-known uh, pancreatic cancer orthoptonous model. So we utilized this mouse model and we ablated 5AC from the KC model to generate the KCM model. And with that, we uh, identified that it's important in maintaining the cancer stem cells during the early panning progression. And is also important in glutamine utilization by the cancer cells and leading to chemo resistance. So while we were working on these lines, we stumbled upon something very interesting. And, and we found that in the 5AC knockout tumors, uh, the ext extracellular matrix or organization is the topmost downregulated pathway. And we started looking into the stromal markers, uh, and we found that while certain markers like alpha SMA and fibronectin were significantly downregulated in the 5AC knockout tumors, there were certain markers like FAP, which was technically unaltered. So it's more than the extent 5AC was basically regulating the stromal heterogeneity in these uh, tumors. So in order to understand the mechanism, we uh, did a lot of uh, in vitro experiments, which showed that the pancreatic stelate cells were not responsible for driving this stromal heterogeneity in the tumor. And then we started looking into the systemic distribution of 5AC, because 5AC is a secreted mucin and it's found in abundance in the serum. And we were uh, surprised to see that 5AC actually goes into the adipose tissue of tumor bearing mouse. And as you can see in this Western blot, um, it's uh, about abundance in the serum of the wild type mouse is there, but it's not present in the adipose tissue. And in the immunohistochemistry, we found that 5AC is actually localized in a very close proximity to the mesenchymal stem cells in these adipose tissue. Uh, so since it's a secreted mucin and found in abundance in the serum, we started looking into uh, whether it is going alone in the adipose tissue or it's carrying the tumor secretome with it. And we did, uh, we pulled down 5AC from the serum and went for a mass spectrometry analysis. Uh, with that, we found that 5AC actually en enriches the CXCR2 ligands with it. And using San Anwich ELISA method, we found that 5AC enriches CXCL7 in the pancreatic tumor and the serum and CXCL5 in the adipose tissue. And we were able to validate this data using pancreatic cancer patient serum, as well as uh, adipose homogenates. So the next question we asked was, how, what is 5AC doing in the adipose tissue? Is it regulating the mesenchymal stem cells? And we were excited to see that 5AC's presence leads to CD44 and CD29, the two classical MSC markers clustering in the adipose tissue, which is known in the literature to enhance the RORAC uh, or to promote the RORAC activation and leading to the migration of these MSCs from the adipose tissue. And uh, when we isolated the MSCs from the um, adipose tissue of the wild type mouse and treated them with 5 person KC serum, we could see that there was a CD44 and CD29 co, uh, co precipitation, which also translated into an activation of the phosphofac and phosphoMLC2, which are migratory cues for these MSCs. And this actually phenotypically manifested in their uh, enhanced migratory ability. And then we started looking into the blood mesenchymal stem cells from the KC and the KCM mouse and found that while the global MSC population represented by the SCAR1 population was high in the KC tumors, uh, KC mouse blood, um, it was, there was one particular population, which is the CD44 and the CD29 uh, positive population, which was significantly low in the blood of the KC mouse. However, this particular population was high in the primary tumor 
uh, in the KC mouse, and that co-localized exactly with the alpha SMA positive population, suggesting that these are, might be the population which gets recruited faster into the KC tumors and leads to the, the stromal heterogeneity. So to address whether the 5AC we see in adipose tissue is, is coming from the tumor or not, we utilized our whole body knockout 5AC model and implanted it with the 5AC uh, expressing and non-expressing cell line. And we were surprised to see that, yes, actually 5AC goes to the adipose tissue from the tumor, as you can see its expression in the wild type uh, ones and not in the knockouts. And when we looked into the allograft tumors, which were made with this 5AC expressing and non-expressing cells mixed with uh, uh, MSCs isolated from the GFP mouse and pancreatic stelate cells from uh, labeled with RFP, we found that there was a significant reduction in the MSC population as well as the alpha SMA population in the 5AC knockout tumors. And uh, the the 5AC um, presence is actually leading to the higher alpha SMA, which is mostly contributed by the MSC and not by the pancreatic steelhead cells. So uh, we were able to uh, validate this data in the human pancreatic tumor samples as well, where we found that the high 5AC expressing tumors had a higher uh, periductal alpha SMA caps, which was significantly lower in the low 5AC group. So with that, I would like to summarize uh, by showing the schematic that 5AC gets upregulated in the uh, pancreatic tumor and it comes out in the systemic circulation and it doesn't come out alone. It actually carries the CXCR2 ligands. In our case, we found CXL7 and CXL5 to be the most significant ones. And along with this secret to the, the tumor secretome, it gets homed into the adipose tissue where it enhances the proliferation of the mesenchymal stem cells by CXCR2 axis which I did not show the data for, but we had the, uh, we found that this is how it is uh, enhancing the proliferation of the MSCs. And also it uh, leads to the uh, class clustering of CD44 and CD29, uh, leading to RORAC activation and uh, cytoskeletal reorganization of these MSCs, by which it actually, these MSCs come out in the system in circulation. And from there, it gets recruited into the primary tumor. And that leads to the uh, stromal heterogeneity, as we saw in our mouse model. With that, I would like to thank my mentors, Dr. Batra and Dr. Kumar, and my lab members, the collaborators, the pathologist. Uh, he helped me a lot with my tissue scoring and everything. And I would also like to thank the funding agencies and the core facilities. And I would like to take any questions if you have. Thank you so much. Great talk, uh, Colina. Uh, open for discussion. Any questions? Uh, Greg Kosinski from Emory. Really a uh, nice story and a, a good example of how the adipose tissue can crosstalk with the tumor. <clears throat> I'm wondering, is there like a saturation point in adipose tissue with how much mucin can be, you know, taken up? Is it completely saturated? And then in the future, do you guys have any plans to put the animals on like a high fat diet or make them obese to tell whether that would further amplify? The, uh, the loop? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so there are, there's a little, there's a, uh, there are a few studies that says that uh, in obesity sample, there are uh, like models, there is a high stromal, uh, stromal development in the pancreatic tumor. And there's a recent study which shows that in obese uh, mouse, the alpha SMA po uh, positive population was the uh, most uh, significant one in this stroma of this pancreatic tumor. So um, if you talk about the saturation point of this mucins, I really do not have an answer right now, but I feel in, if, you comp if we com compare the, um, the spontaneous model versus our implantation model, I feel in the spontaneous model, the amount of 5AC that I could see in the adipose tissue was way higher. So I feel it's more of a continuous um, a deposition or the continuous uh, sequestration of these mucins in the adipose tissue. And uh, mucins being... Um, uh, hydrating molecules and adipose being a hydrophobic tissue. So I kind of feel that it gets stuck there. So it might be a constant process. Uh, I don't right now know about the saturation point though. Yeah, really beautiful work. Looks like a good target too for therapeutics in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, any questions? If no questions, I'll, I'll take the last one. The, the MUC, MUC uh, 5AC looks like in IAC, it's mm -hmm. present in the apical region of the duct. Do they present in the whole duct or the, in just the apical region? So I think uh, when the uh, neoplastic onset begins, it kind of 
uh, saturates in the epical side because the, um, uh, that's how the membrane, uh, the, these mucins are supposed to be there on the epithelial surface. But I feel with the, as the cancer progresses, there's a loss of epical basal polarity and also uh, in the uh, like high grade ducts and in a poor differentiated tumors, you kind of do not see the epical or the basal side. So that's how I feel the 5AC basically gets stuck inside the tumor stroma as well because it's a secreted one. Okay. Um, do you know what signaling activates this? Uh, the expression. expression. So um, its regulation transcriptional level uh, is not yet that much studied, but I feel um, with our in vitro experiments, I find I've, I've found that if you induce KRAS, um, that enhances 5AC, and there are also certain chromatin modifiers like NCO3, and um, which basically regulates the expression at, uh, at an epigenetic level. Okay, great. No questions, means thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you Our next presentation is entitled Hemoglobin A1C Further Stratifies Risk of Cancer Among Patients with Family History of Pancreatic Cancer. Our presenter is Eva Lustigova from Kaiser Permanente. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present um, on behalf of the team at Kaiser Permanente, Southern California. Our study was made possible through funding as an ancillary study to the new onset diabetes uh, study, um, uh, funding through the National Cancer Institute. While most um, pancreatic cancer cases are sporadic in nature, approximately 10 to 20% of cases occur in predisposing, uh, in the setting of predisposing factors such as um, acute pancreatitis or uh, chronic pancreatitis, um, as well as hereditary syndromes or familial history. Um, new onset hyperglycemia or diabetes have been reported um, to be now um, also risk factors for pancreatic cancer. Approximately um, among patients uh, over the age of 50, there has been reported about six to eight fold increase in risk of pancreatic cancer. Uh, new onset um, hyperglycemia and diabetes, therefore, presents an opportunity for further risk stratification among patients uh, with um, those um, um, predisposing factors such as family history. Our aims were to evaluate the risk factors of pancreatic cancer among patients with family history. We specifically set out to evaluate the um, role of hemoglobin A1C new onset versus long-standing diabetes, acute and chronic pancreatitis, as well as body mass index and weight loss. Our study setting, we conducted the study within Kaiser Permanente of Southern California, which is an integrated healthcare system that provides um, healthcare delivery system to a large diverse and multi-ethnic group of patients. Um, over 4.7 million members are served by KPSC um, and spans um, color, um, entire region of um, Southern California. Um, our patient population was restricted to those with first, at least having first one, one first degree family um, um, relative. And we conducted a case control study um, patients were identified between January 1st of 2008 through December 31st of 2019. Our cases were identified using the internal case, um, in, internal uh, cancer registry system, as well as the California state death piles. And we uh, included our controls matching one to four uh, contemporaneous. Um, for risk factors, we assessed demographics, comorbidities, as well as clinical parameters. Specifically, we set out to assess the role of A1C. Uh, we included the most recent A1C in the last two years. Um, for diabetes, we included um, definition based on both combination of diagnosis codes, laboratory measures, as well as medications. New onset diabetes was defined as diagnoses in the last six months. Um, and we also looked at longstanding diabetes. We provided descriptive sum summary of cases. I looked at age at cancer diagnoses um, and 
um, provided a co or conducted a conditional logistic regression uh, to estimate the odds and provide 95% confidence intervals. And among risk factors, we assess the role of age, race, ethnicity, and sex, uh, looked at the history of acute and chronic pancreatitis, as well as BMI and weight loss, and assessed the role of hemoglobin A1C. We started out with about 44,000 patients uh, with family history of pancreatic cancer. Um, we then uh, looked, restricted that cohort to patients over the age of 18 with at least one clinic-based encounter between the study period. We then excluded 15 patients that developed pancreatic cancer prior to the study period, ended up with approximately 42,000 patients that qualified. From that, um, we uh, required patients to have had at least one A1C in the two years prior to the index date or to the date of um, pancreatic cancer diagnoses, um, required to have at least one year continuous membership and have had at least one clinic-based encounter in the six months prior. Uh, we ended up with 168 cases and 672 controls. Uh, in terms of uh, patient characteristics, what I want to just draw your attention to is that we ultimately um, found 11 cases under the age of 50. Um, patients uh, with uh, pancreatic cancer were significantly more likely to have two or more relatives with pancreatic cancer. Uh, they were a lot more significantly likely to have either new or long-standing diabetes compared to uh, controls and we're um, significantly more likely to have higher A1C um, compared to controls. Um, our cases also had much higher uh, history of acute pancreatitis as well as history of chronic pancreatitis. However, for further analysis, uh, further analysis we combined these two groups since they were relatively small in size. Here, I'd like to point, uh, bring your attention to uh, the weight loss that was reported among pancreatic cancer cases. Our cases uh, had a median weight loss of 13 pounds over uh, the prior one year. And in our logistic regression analyses, um, our cases were 4.5 times, um, th those with two plus relatives were 4.5 five times more likely to develop pancreatic cancer among, compared to those that did not. Um, and um, being overweight and obese was found to be protective. Rate, race, ethnicity, and uh, sex were not statistically significant. Uh, when we looked at diabetes status, we unfortunately were not powered to look at the uh, longstanding versus new onset diabetes. However, diabetes status was um, found to be uh, statistically significant. Patients with um, diabetes were more likely um, to um, develop pancreatic cancer and history of AP and CP were, were also very significant. So in conclusion, um, in addition to the extent um, of family history, diabetes status and hyperglycemia were independent risk factors, acute and chronic pancreatitis were also strongly associated with pancreatic cancer among patients with first degree relatives. Attention to diabetes status as well as pancreatitis may provide opportunity for further risk stratification. Just want to briefly mention our future direction. We do plan to conduct additional analysis to further characterize those pancreatic cancer cases and are also working in parallel with our genetic group um, at Kaiser Permanente to uh, look at data from um, their analyses. Um, we have now been able to acquire data from prior to um, the NCCN uh, guidelines implementations, but we have a um, cohort of about 5,000 patients that have high-risk gene mutations and found a small overlap with our existing cohorts so plan to conduct the analysis. And lastly, I want to thank our team uh, at Kaiser Permanente, the Pancreas Research Institute, and thank, thank, thank you to APA for giving us an opportunity to present our data. Thank you. Are there any questions? 
So I have a question. Why does obesity decrease the risk for pancreatic cancer? A lot of studies have shown that it increases the risk. Our, I mean, our, uh, our results clearly show that um, patients um, that develop cancer were more likely to um, have experienced weight loss. Um, so it's... So in other words, we need to look for the skinny diabetic who's, or someone who's lost weight that has a high hemoglobin A1C. That's right. right. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your paper. Thank you. Thank you. I'm moving on to the next presentation. Um, the presenter, Vanaja Kanduri from uh, Baylor College Medicine. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, A Unique Subset of Cytotoxic Effector Memory T Cells Enhances the Efficacy of CAR T Cell Therapy in a Model of Pancreatic Rectal Renal Carcinoma. Thank you, APA, for uh, giving me this opportunity to present our work. Um, these are my um, disclosures. So the critical observation for the work that I'm presenting today dates back to five or six years ago, where we have seen that when antigenically um, specific CD8 NK1.1 positive cells were adoptively transferred into naive mice, they offered durable protection compared to equal number of NK1.1 negative cells. So we are a dendritic cell biology lab and we work on cell-based therapies. Um, and we, in a pilot experiment where we wanted to see if cell-based therapy in combination with standard of care gemcitabine could be more effective than gemcitabine alone, we orthotopically induced tumors into the mice and tracked them uh, over a period of time and did T-cell analysis at different time points and saw that CD8 NK1.1 positive markers significantly came up in the mice that were treated with combination therapy. And uh, these mice not only survived the primary tumor, but they also survived the re-challenge. And when we adoptively transferred them into naive mice that were challenged with um, tumors, they offered significant um, tumor protection and improved survival. So to validate that we are identified a uh, subset of T cells that is uh, uh, functions in a model independent fashion, we repeated these experiments in a couple of other models, uh, influenza and also melanoma. In the influenza model, the mice were subjected to influenza infection. And when they recovered, we isolated the cells and adoptively transferred them into naive mice that were subsequently challenged with the virus. And we saw that the CD8 uh, NK1.1 positive cells offer durable protection and improved survival. Um, and we saw similar results in our melanoma tumor model. So at this point, we were pretty convinced that we were working with a cell population that is highly cytotoxic, has memory, um, and uh, is model independent. So the next step was to look for humans because uh, nothing gets funded if you don't show data in human cells, right? So uh, the human equivalent of NK1.1 is CD161. It's a typical NK cell marker, but it's also expressed on um, CD4, CD8, and also TCR uh, gamma delta T cells. Uh, the most well-characterized CD161 expressing T cells are the CD4 T cells, which are regulatory T cells with a TH17 type of um, phenotype. But we are interested in the memory stem cell-like phenotype that respond to antigen uh, presenting cells pulsed with viral peptides, uh, which is what we saw in our work. So to uh, determine if these are uh, transcriptionally phenotypically conserved across the human and the mouse models, we did a microarray analysis on these cells. Um, in the mouse models, we did the microarray analysis on the antigen uh, experienced uh, cells. And in the human model, we did this in freshly isolated CD161 cells from healthy donors. And we saw that but there was a significant uh, several fold upregulation of granzymes and innate stress-like receptors in these cells. Um, so everything was going well at this point, and now we changed tracks and we started focusing more on the human subset. And uh, we wanted to ask if these exhibit the same kind of cytotoxicity that we saw in the mice. And to do this, we uh, co-cultured these cells with allogenic uh, target cells, a freshly isolated 161 cells uh, against 293 cells. And as you can see from the graph, uh, these have significantly uh, higher levels of cytotoxicity compared to their negative uh, counterparts or the bulk PBMCs. But they do not have any innate NK cell activity because when we co-cultured them against NK cell targets K5622 lines, they did not really kill. So this tells us that the cytotoxicity is mediated by the uh, TCR signaling. So at this point, um, since we were pretty encouraged by all the protective responses and the transcriptional analysis data that we have seen, we wanted to see if we could use this subset as uh, candidates for CAR T cell therapy. 
So to do this, we got uh, freshly isolated cells, bulk PBMCs from healthy donors, uh, sorted them into 161 positive, negative, and transduced them with a second generation car construct, which is already in clinic from our collaborators. And after proliferation expansion, we use these cells as um, effectors against the human tumors implanted in skid mice. So um, in our both in vitro and in vivo analysis, both short-term and long-term cytotoxicity uh, chromium assays, we saw that not only these cell cells um, and uh, exhibit enhanced cytotoxicity, they kill faster, they kill better, and uh, they offer uh, specificity because you do not see this uh, killing against HER2 negative uh, targets like Raji cells. So what is the mechanism? How are these cells able to function so well? Um, so is it proliferation? Is it exhaustion? Is it increased cytotoxicity? Or is it uh, homing? So to do this, we repeatedly antigenically stimulated these cells. And upon four consecutive antigenic stimulations, we saw that these cells were significantly less exhausted uh, compared to the nth given for a CD161 negative or the bulk PBMCs, which is uh, could be an important factor in CAR T cell therapy. And when we use these cells as effectors against um, uh, tumors, implanted in mice, we saw that these cells offer durable protection reduced to tumor burden. So to deep, uh, you know, dig deeper into the mechanism, uh, we also isolated the cells from the tumor microenvironment. Uh, and we can see that the mice that received the 161 positive HER2 car construct cells uh, had significantly elevated levels of granzyme and reduced cytotoxicity and better homing. So all this suggests that we have been working with a population of cells that are highly cytotoxic memory and and tissue homing, and they have a conserved transcriptional profile, and they kill with greater speed and efficiency, both in vitro and in vivo, and could be offering a new opportunity for CAR T cell therapy uh, against pancreatic tumors. Um, so as I said in the beginning, ours is a genetic cell lab, and uh, we work on basic biology. So we wanted to ask, are there any innate signals that are uh, driving the expression of CD161 on these T cells? So in the past, we have seen that uh, when we polarize DCs to a 2H1 phenotype and when we co-culture uh, T cells, there is a significant upregulation of NK1.1 on these T cells. So we saw similar results in humans. Uh, T cells polarized with TH1 DCs had elevated levels of CD161 that were highly cytotoxic, less exhausted. And when you dump um, microvesicles uh, from the TH2 polarized DCs, which are known to contain more CTLA4, which we have extensively shown in the past, the CD161 levels go down and they become more exhausted and less cyt cytotoxic. And it is reversed when you siRNA treat uh, the cells with CTLA4. So this suggests that there is an innate derived signal in the form of CTLA4 derived loaded microvesicles from the dendritic cells to the T cells, which probably governs the expression of CD161 on these T cells. And that drives us to our future directions where we want to really explore uh, this innate biology, innate derived signals on the uh, biology and functional properties of CD161 cells. Specifically, uh, we want to discuss, uh, identify the link and uh, mechanism we, uh, you know, about the DHC derived CTLA4 positive vesicles and the expression of CD161. And we are also working on identifying the downstream uh, regulatory mechanism signaling pathways. Um, and uh, in a preclinical uh, trial, we are trying to GMP scale upregulate the, you know, production of these cells. Uh, for uh, clinical translation. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, our lab, my mentor, um, Dr. William Decker is in the audience here. Thank you so much, Will, and rest of the group. And I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you, Anaja. Uh, open for discussion. You can go ahead. No, no, you came first, please, I insist. <laughs> Great talk. Um, quick question. So uh, how many models of PDAC have you tested? Because clearly it works, right? So have you tested it out in the spontaneous models? No, that's a good question. We just jumped from um, using the cell lines, uh, you know, and then we did these ones for the CAR T cell therapy. We have uh, tested against like different, because we wanted HER2 expression on the CAR, uh, on the pancreatic cells. So we screened several cell lines, but we uh, took the one that had the least killing ability so that we could show the efficacy. But no, we have not done uh, several models in the uh, mice. Thank you. We'll go A2Bio, great work. Uh, Thank you. A, well, I may have missed it. Did you ever do serial killing experiments with Yes, cells? that's the uh, repeated antigenic stimulation where we killed, uh, gave the targets serially for four times and we kept tracking the cytotoxicity and exhaustion proliferation of the cells. So technically, did you bring it out? You take the, cell, the, the, the CD8 cells out or do you put a new target back no, in? No, we put the new target back in. And then how, and then so those chromium release assays, how do you then make sure that 
you saw also additional proliferation or did you just see? We did uh, see if, uh, no, for the lysis was the chromium release assay, but for the serial dilution, you know, serial co-culture experiment, we did not do the chromium. We just did the flow for the cells to look for the proliferation with the CFSE based system. And then now you're doing a serial, you're trying to do a CGMP uh, scale up to see yes. if you get so. Yeah. But then how do you, how are you going to, I mean, you still see some, you know, like your lag or TIM3 lag. And also, are you going to be able to see that you're going to exhaust at all, though? Because you still could exhaust just by, by continued proliferation, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what we saw. They were less exhausted compared to the CD161 negative cells, even under continuous proliferation. And then are you looking at other cytokines like interferon gamma and other? other uh, we did look at granzymes and interferon gamma, and they, those were high, um, but like the exhaustion was low. That was great. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Next. Just a quick question. Really nice talk. Exciting uh, new cell subset. I'm wondering, have, has your group done a lot of work and it may be buried in your papers um, regarding the persistence of these cells in vivo? And do you think you need CD4s in there with them or will CD8s be enough? So that's a good question. And that's the question one of the reviewers asked us. So as you can see, uh, I mean, you can go back and, you know, uh, I can send you the paper if you are interested. Um, so we tested these cells against the bulk PBMCs, which also contain CD4s, but we have not tested them against isolated CD4s. So those bulk PBMCs might contain like, you know, regulated T cells and, you know, a lot of things happen in culture. Uh, and we did not see that it was necessary for us to supplement the CD8 cars with the CD4s because we already saw a good efficacy with just the CD8 themselves against the bulk PBMC. But that's something that to keep in mind and uh, in future, you know, uh, we'll be addressing that. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to a quick question from me. Uh, is because this, the toxicity is due to the CAR T cells are able to recognize the target expressed in the on the non-malignant cells? The toxicity on, is due on to the, the CAR T cells express able to express that uh, recognize the target on the non-malignant cells is due to that, or why the toxicity is so high? I mean, we think that it is because they have this high uh, expression of the granzymes and innately cytotoxic. Yeah, that, that's what we think. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next paper is the effect of CT, CFTR modulators and acute pancreatitis and exocrine pancreatic function in patients with cystic fibrosis, a systemic review of the literature. And it's being presented by Dr. Mitchell Ramsey from Ohio State University. Thanks for the introduction. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll try to rush through this um, as a systematic review. We have a lot of data, and so I'll just sort of be hitting on the highlights. I'd like to start, uh, start by talking a little bit about some background on CFTR modulators, and a lot of you are probably somewhat familiar with them, so I'll go through this relatively quickly. There are two main categories of CFTR modulators, and that includes potentiators and correctors. The only potentiator right now is Ivacaftor, and this is approved for patients with gating mutations, and it's very effective in these patients. However, patients with gating mutations only make up about 5 to 10% of the population in the U.S. with cystic fibrosis. So correctors were developed for patients who have the F508 deletion mutation, which makes up about 85% of Americans with cystic fibrosis. These have modest responses compared to Ivacaftor alone, but you have to remember it's in a much more severe mutation. Those drugs were initially indicated for the pulmonary benefits. However, CFTR is not just expressed in the lung, but is also expressed throughout the gastrointestinal tract, including the pancreas. And a number of studies have reported some observational outcomes looking at a variety of pancreas functions. Um, for example, the arrival kiwi and climb studies were uh, interventional studies, and they reported some exploratory outcomes like fecal elastase, serum trypsin, amylase, and lipase, and all of those measures improved when patients were on treatment with CFTR modulators. A lot of us are probably familiar with a paper from the Hopkins group about CFTR modulators reducing recurrent acute pancreatitis and pancreas sufficient cystic fibrosis, and there have been a handful of other case reports that we'll go through today. So we performed a systematic review to determine the effects of CFTR modulators on reported pancreas outcomes in human subjects with cystic fibrosis. We used a search strategy encompassing synonyms for cystic fibrosis, CFTR modulators, and a variety of pancreas outcomes, which are listed there. We performed the search in April, and we looked to include any human subjects um, that had baseline and on-treatment measures for these pancreas outcomes. 
This is an overview of our study. We identified 630 studies and ultimately whittled that down to about 40. And you can see the risk of bias was generally serious just based on the study, the observational nature. Getting into the results, uh, acute pancreatitis data was presented for 27 subjects across eight studies. And you can see that overall, the rate ratio reduced by uh, 81%. And in subgroup analyses of patients with pancreas sufficient cystic fibrosis, that was 87%. And for the very small number of patients with pancreas insufficient cystic fibrosis, there's probably a reduction, but we were underpowered to detect a difference. Next, we'll talk about exocrine pancreatic sufficiency. And in the cystic fibrosis world, in contrast to the chronic pancreatitis world, uh, fecal elastase is not often used for this measure. It's more based on clinical symptoms. Um, and the majority of studies reported this outcome. So of 253 patients who were pancreas insufficient at baseline, 21% of those converted to pancreas sufficiency during the course of treatment. Uh, there was a subset analysis of about 35 patients and of those who converted to pancreas sufficiency, they were younger than those who remained pancreas insufficient. The similar uh, situation is true with fecal elastase. Uh, data was reported for 144 subjects and the mean absolute increase in fecal elastase was 165.3. Again, we performed a subgroup analysis of about 35 patients who had uh, all their individual data and those with above average increases in fecal elastase were younger and they were more likely to have a detectable fecal elastase at baseline. A handful of studies reported serum markers like trypsin, amylase, and lipase, and these improved in all subjects. Uh, only two studies looked at pancreas enzyme replacement therapy doses, uh, and this was probably the most homogeneous outcome we had just because there were so few subjects. The uh, mean baseline enzyme dose was 10,000 units of lipase per kilo per day, which decreased by about 60% by the end of treatment. And you can see here of the four patients listed, one patient was liberated from pancreas enzymes entirely. Lastly, there were a handful of other miscellaneous outcomes, and I'd be happy to talk with you in more detail about these papers, but we won't go through them uh, individually. So some conclusions, CFTR modulator use is associated with reduced acute pancreatitis events, and the risk reduction really depends on pancreas sufficiency, where patients who are pancreas sufficient have a greater reduction in acute pancreatitis than patients who are insufficient. There is improved exocrine function among patients treated with CFTR modulators. When you measure this either by fecal elastase or a surrogate, which is clinical symptoms and pancreas sufficiency. Again, this benefits greater in younger patients who have some residual pancreas function at baseline. And lastly, CFTR modulator use is associated with reduced pancreatic inflammation assessed by serum trypsin, amylase, and lipase. So to conclude, in order to maximize the uh, efficacy of CFTR modulators, they need to be started early. I think these observations warrant further investigation in animal models or patients with CFTR-related pancreatic pathologies. And I'd like to end with this statement from the uh, Peter Heggie review article about five years ago that correcting CFTR dysfunction could be the first specific therapy in pancreatitis. Thank you. Questions? Congrats, Mitch. This is great work, and you're definitely on the right path of bridging some of the gaps between pediatric and adult medicine, and CFTR is a great disease model to do that. Um, I, I know that in younger children, that when they are exocrine insufficient, you're absolutely right, so your literature review is on par with the physiology, that if you start CFTR modulators and correctors, there's a window by which you can reverse that lost function. So the younger, the better. And really it's like maybe even in toddler ages. Um, but then they start having, once you move them from insufficient to sufficient pancreatitis. Yeah. And that's been reported that you increase pancreatitis risk. So how do you uh, justify that the acute pancreatitis was less it's once you've done the CFTR modulators and correctors? Sure. Um, so, um... I think there have been three reports of patients who were insufficient, who developed sufficiency, and then had acute pancreatitis. And if you go through those studies, they all reference back to the first um, report, which I think was uh, by uh, Megala was the name. They called it time for a gut check. Um, and I think there was some reporting bias based on that observation. Um, so we looked in the large database using market scan to try to determine if patients with pancreas insufficiency or sufficiency have this sort of um, 
transfer and increase risk of pancreatitis. And we didn't find it to be true in a big data set. But I think you're right, identifying which patients are going to benefit, whether they turn from sufficient, insufficient to sufficient, or whether they get pancreatitis, I think that's an area for further study. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we're going to have to cut off the questions. We've been notified by the administration that we're running over time. So we apologize if, if you can bring your questions up to the speakers afterwards. Thank you. Also, you can post them on the meeting app so that the speakers can address them too. Thank you. Moving on to the next presentation, the, uh, the presenter is Maria Manberg from MD Anderson Cancer Center. The title of the talk is Occult Polyclonality of a Preclinical Pancreatic Cancer Models Drives in Vitro Evolution. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Got it. Um, I'm going to try and kind of go through this and only cover the most important details since we're a little bit behind time. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for sticking around and to the APA for giving me this opportunity. Um, all right. So general intro to pancreatic cancers, as we know, the majority of them are exocrine um, in the Mitra lab, where I am a graduate student. We work mainly on uh, PDEX. Um, so uh, what I'm going to focus on are the preclinical models of PDAC, uh, mainly the cell lines and the organoids that we use to um, kind of model this disease prior to getting to the clinic. Um, a lot of the basis for this study was inspired by the fact that in, the, uh, in recent years in the clinic, we have seen little progress. Um, and we were wondering whether this, uh, this lack of efficacy in the clinic was due to just incorrect assumptions about pancreatic cancer that we were getting from the cell lines and from the things that we're using to model them. Um, so there was a really great study by uh, Yuri Ben David and the, the group at the DEPMAP um, consortia back in 2018 that kind of started to look at things like this. So with the advent of single cell technologies, we decided to basically run the full gamut of what we could do with single cell techniques to really dig deep into these cell lines um, and kind of understand what underlying heterogeneity might be there. Um, this work is currently put out um, as a preprint on BioArchive. So if I don't cover enough of the details, you're welcome to go and check it out. It's also under review. So a couple of changes have been made since that was submitted. Um, but either way, the main findings pretty much remain the same as what was initially shared. And that is that the PDAC cell lines display heterogeneity at a, at a single cell level. That um, when we look at cell lines that are supposedly the same. So if I'm working on MIAPACA in the MITRE lab, someone else in another lab is working on MIAPACA, how translational and comparable are my MIAPACA results to yours? We wanted to understand that. And we find that there's actually a, a fair amount of variability at both the CNA and RNA levels. Um, we also found that the spheroid growth model promotes transcriptional heterogeneity and that this heterogeneity is driven largely by epigenetic remodeling in the spheroid setting. Um, this was important for us to understand because spheroids and 3D models are becoming more and more prevalent in the field, um, given that there's a lot of literature showing that it more closely mimics what's happening in the clinic. So we really wanted to figure out, okay, is, is, that, is that the case? And we also work with patient-derived organoids. So we wanted to understand um, to what point can you sustain these cultures where they are still representative of the original patient tumor. Um, and we found that they do in fact evolve um, in ways that are not necessarily alarming, but definitely important to keep in mind. Um, I think I want that button, there we go. So at a pseudobulk level, looking at the single cell RNA and CNV data here, we find that the cell lines are largely who we think they are. Um, I looked at miapacas, I looked from three different sources, um, PANC1, grown in 2D and 3D, um, the classical normal models, HPDE and HPNE cell lines, um, HPOF2 and uh, BXPC3, and they stain for canonically the markers that they should be staining for, which is a good sanity check. All of these were fingerprinted, so that was also good. Um, but when we look at the single cell CNV level, um, we find a huge uh, level of heterogeneity in the amount of clones per population and also the CNV events, both in terms of amplifications and deletions that differ, not just between the cell lines, but within different clones of these cell lines. Um, that extends a little bit further. We decided to take the single cell CNV data, apply some extra thresholds um, to make sure that we were only looking at like the highest quality clones to make sure that our, our result, results wouldn't be a function of artifact. And when we mapped um, the CNV events to 
um, regions that were um, that are implicated in uh, pancreatic cancer loci. So things that are commonly deleted or amplified. We find huge variations in ploidy, not again, not just across the cell lines, but across clones within each of the cell lines. Um, and then we also find that our normals are not normal. So anyone using HPDE, this was really shocking to us, and it is an important finding that it's not actually representative of a normal cell line whatsoever. Um, not only in terms, we confirmed the single cell C. Oh God, we confirmed the single cell CNV events um, with uh, whole exome sequencing. And then when we zoomed in, we found there were many events that were that were of note. But most importantly, um, is that this ginormous Aurora kinase amplification in HPDE um, or our kinase A is, is a uh, very important gene in, in pancreatic cancer progression. And so knowing that one of our normal controls harbors that um, is definitely something to, to consider. Um, then looking at this custodial variability across cell lines from different labs, um, we find both in terms of RNA um, and DNA that there are functionally significant differences in these clones where um, at the genomic level, uh, CNV events are driving the separation of clones and culture that have transcriptomic consequences. Um, then looking at the spheroid growth model, we found that um, at the, in, the, in the spheroid, we not only had a higher number of clusters, um, which indicates higher transcriptional heterogeneity now in these 3D models, um, but that when we went to um, combine the single cell RNA with single nuclei attack sequencing from these samples, that in the spheroid model, we see an enrichment of SPF, uh, SP and KLF motifs versus in the pink 2D, we end up seeing um, an enrichment in uh, motifs associated with fossil dunes. Um, and then when we confirmed that in the single cell RNA sequencing, we find that in the pink 3D, um, we see a huge upregulation of genes associated with the SP KLF motifs versus in the 2D, and upregulation of fossil gene associated genes. So that is um, kind of confirming that these epigenetic modifications and um, differential motif enrichment actually have a transcriptional consequence. Um, and then looking at our organoids, oh God, 45 seconds. Okay. When we look at our organoids here, um, we find that we took two cultures uh, basically separated by uh, 10 passages. And we find that there is considerable evolution in culture over time, um, most notably when we consider the um, PDAC classification schema for the molecular subtypes based on RNA that we know and love. Um, in the early um, passages, we see, uh, hold on, I wanna make sure I'm pointing at this correctly. Um, we, the better way to explain this is that over time, we end up seeing subtype heterogeneity um, where we see a mix of basal and classical genes expressed, which is not necessarily um, what we see in the early passage. Um, so overall, um, the cell lines are evolving over time. We have a, an awesome amount of heterogeneity and diversity on both a, on, a, on a CNV level and RNA level, and also at the epigenetic level. Um, and not, not to cause alarm or anything, but these are important things to consider, especially now that we're seeing um, things like disease re uh, therapeutic resistance evolving in the clinic, um, knowing what the genomic and functional basis for these things are and the context that we're studying them in the preclinical space really matter. So with that, um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to everybody that I work with. Um, the Mitra Lab is, is really a phenomenal place and I'm so lucky to have all of the wonderful collaborators that I do. Um, all right, that's, that's that. Thank you, Maria. Uh, please post your uh, questions on the meeting app. Sorry about that, Maria. Yeah, or just come catch me later. I'm, I'm around. Sure. <laughs> I will. So our next speaker is talking about generating patient-derived organoid models of disease from pre-treated patients in a clinically certified laboratory setting, a critical set step towards precision medicine in pancreatic cancer. And our presenter is Dr. Haley Zlamki. That's correct, thank you. Um, thank you all everybody for sticking around. Um, again, and thank you for getting through my title. I know it's a long one. I uh, commend the um, organizers for putting this talk after Maria's because I think it's a great transition. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, today I'm gonna be talking to you about the advantages of organoid models, um, the methods of our development, kind of our novel results in a CLIA setting and future directions of study. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, especially with this group, um, as you all know that pancreatic cancer is a terrible uh, diagnosis. 
But I found it interesting that overall in the United States, there is a 31% decline um, in cancer with 3.2 uh, million fewer deaths. However, PDOC is on the rise still. And uh, as you can see on the right, there is, it pretends a terrible prognosis, especially compared to uh, other common cancers in the United States. Part of the reasons we have been unable um, to kind of catch up with the rest of the other cancer studies is the historic ways in which we've been studying them. Um, Two-dimensional cell lines don't always recapitulate the patient's tumor as well as we would like. Um, other things are very costly and time consuming. So we've kind of overcome these hurdles by establishing organoids, um, which can better recapitulate the tumor environment. And um, we can also do this um, by studying the ductal component. It pretty much selects for the ductal component and uh, proliferates in a rapid time frame within two to four weeks, um, which as we all know, uh, PDAC has a lot of stroma and, so, and low neoplastic cellularity. So this has been a hurdle that we've been able to overcome. Our lab has defined the three uh, phases of organoid establishment um, development as establishment, which is the ability of any organoid to grow, expansion, um, subsequent uh, proliferation through passaging, and then finally characterization. Um, the next hurdle in taking what we've learned um, from our research lab into the clinic is kind of put in place hurdles by CLIA, which stands for Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, but essentially it's a set of rules, regulations, and standards um, that the US has before driving um, our research into the clinic. And uh, by bringing our organoids into the CLIA environment, we're taking the next step in the um, classical bench to bedside model. So therefore, our hypothesis becomes that organoids can be established from pretreated tumors in a CLIA certified laboratory to provide clinically actionable information. So how we do this is by taking the patient tumor and with uh, mechanical and enzymatic digestion, we resuspend in a extracellular matrix um, protein to provide the scaffold for the three-dimensional organoids to grow. Um, our primary outcomes were the rate of success in a CLIA lab from pretreated organoids, um, our establishment expansion and characterization rates. And additional considerations were the actual neoadjuvant regimen that they received, the pathologic response score on histology, and um, our ability for very early passage characterization. So we took 18 uh, se um, sequential patients that had received neoadjuvant therapy, and from there we had an 89% success rate for, of establishment. And from there, uh, with the 69% uh, were able to be expanded and characterized with only five patient tumors that failed to expand. And on the right, you can see just under light microscopy what organoids look like. This is about day 14 without any passaging, so they grow pretty rapidly. Um, the other thing we wanted to look at was the actual neoadjuvant that they received, and those that were able to be characterized, about half received fulfirinox, and then half received gemcitabine and abraxane, with the median pathologic response score staying the same between those that were successful and those that failed, which basically showed us that Despite um, receiving heavy chemotherapeutic pressure um, with varying responses um, on their tumor on pathology, we were still able to grow their organoids. This is a somewhat crude uh, picture of organoid culture over time, essentially with a lot of normal cells um, proliferating from stem cells and then cancer taking over. So we wanted to figure out where along this time frame is the earliest possible way where we could get um, study the cancer without um, having this kind of normal contamination. So we took um, eight patient samples um, between passages zero and one and sequenced their DNA. And we found that about 50% of the time we were able to detect PDAC mutations. 50% um, of the time the culture was not yet um, enriched for cancer. And I uh, emphasize yet, because as you can see with this small heat map, um, on the left is a patient at passage zero. When we sequenced their organoids, um, there's the four kind of mountains of genetic mutations that were described the other night, that TP53, KRAS, and BKN2A, and SMAD4. Um, we were unable to pick this up very early in culture. However, at passage six, you can see the top three um, had a quite high uh, variant allele frequency. So they exist and they're there, they're just not able to be um, called on a bioinformatics level. So therefore we conclude that there may be an optimal time frame to ensure normal epithelial regression and tumor proliferation. Um, pass, if you do it too early, then the molecular data may not be available to you, and too late, then the patient has already received um, adjuvant chemotherapy, and the decision for what their adjuvant may be uh, has already been made. So we suggest a bit of a Goldilocks zone, um, passages three to six, in order to be able to study the tumor, use their biology, 
and then make a decision um, for their adjuvant therapy while they're recovering from surgery in the post-operative period. So in summary, our organoids can be successfully established, expanded, and characterized from pretreated tumors. Um, early characterization is optimized around uh, passages three to six. And um, more importantly, this is the first example of organoid utilization in a high volume academic center for precision medicine. Um, and they can be characterized early enough for clinical impact within a CLIA environment. And our next steps will be to utilize our established CLIA pipeline and increase novel ways uh, to utilize the organoids for precision medicine. I would like to thank um, all of the individuals listed here, including Dr. Rick Burkhart, my primary mentor, um, our patients, our families, and the financial support from the Foundation's Flow and the American Pancreatic Association for this opportunity. Thank you again. If you can post your questions or discuss this with Haley at the break, we appreciate it. Uh, next is the uh, last presentation of this session. Uh, the presenter, Arpad Varga, from University of uh, Sigad. The title of the uh, talk is Interplay of ORI-1 Calcium Channel and Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator, the CFTR in Epithelial Physiology. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me start with a short introduction with the CFTR, which is generally locating at the epical membrane of the, thank you, primary epithelial cells. Uh, as a chloride and a biocarbonate channel, it regulates both the pH and the composition of the secreted fluid in various tissues. Uh, any failure or dysregulation of the CFTR could lead pathophysiological conditions such as cystic fibrosis, CF-associated liver disease, pancreatitis, or um, diarrhea can caused by uh, cholera bacteria toxin, for example. CFTR is simultaneously regulated by uh, calcium and CAMP uh, signaling pathways at the same time. Uh, we also know that the general increase of the intracellular calcium level can activate the channel. And we also know that, that the cyclic AMP can activate CFTR through protein kinase A. Uh, in a recent publication, it was shown that uh, there is a PKA independent activation by calcium elevation where the uh, calmodulin which is binding the uh, calcium can directly interact with the CFTR, the R domain of the CFTR, and therefore it is able to activate the channel. However, uh, the whole mechanism behind uh, underlying behind this uh, synergistic regulation is still unexplored. Uh, we know from the literature that there is a certain uh, calcium channel, namely this uh, ORI1 channel, which are able to activate uh, chloride channels, calcium sensitive chloride channels, such as onoctomin 1 in acrine spat glands. And we also know that this uh, store operated calcium entry channel has a store independent regulation as well, which is promoted by SPCA2 uh, uh, endoplasmatic reticulum membrane protein. So the question arose the whether it is if it's possible that uh, there is some kind of similar regulation uh, behind the regulation of the physiological drive of, of CFTR. So actually this is our uh, aim to reveal the uh, calcium dependent regulation of CFTR in primary epithelial cells. And we also aim to identify the molecular elements and to investigate the tissue specificity of the phenomenon. So first of all, uh, after store operated calcium entry related gene expression pattern analysis, we have found that this certain uh, uh, molecule, the ORI1 channel has an apical localization on the primary pancreatic ductal epithelial cells. Co-localization of CFTR and uh, ORI1 is demonstrated here on mouse pancreatic ductal organoid cultures, suggesting their potential interaction, which was confirmed by super-resolution microscopy. We have found that uh, the native and uh, also the co-transfected protein uh, were in physical proximity to each other. Then we have performed some yeah, we have performed some uh, uh, physiological measurements as well. We challenged the ducts, the isolated pancreatic ducts with chloride-free extracellular solution resulted in a decrease in the intracellular chloride level. Actually, it is an, it is an increase in the uh, figure because of the uh, fluorescence of uh, the MQAE uh, chloride sensitive dye. This answer was totally abolished by CFTR inhibitor, suggesting that the response is mainly CFTR dependent. Global calcium chelation by BAPTA EM or ORI1 inhibition uh, leads the same abolished signal. Um, in the other hand, if uh, 
we generally increased the intracellular calcium level by calcium ionophoreinomycin, it was not sufficient to maintain CFTR activity during oribon inhibition, confirming the idea that uh, uh, the calcium influx through ORI1 is mandatory for CFTR activity. We have found the same colocalization pattern in case of mouse liver, uh, lung, and human pancreas derived organoids as well in the apical membrane. And we have found that ORI1 inhibition uh, has, um, yeah, has a decrease, uh, it, it is decreasing the uh, resting intracellular calcium level in each epithelial cell types. The same treatment caused a significant decrease in uh, uh, CFTR activity as well, from which we can conclude this phenomenon uh, can be applicable to all secretory epithelial cells. As I mentioned before, CFTR is a cyclic AMP dependent channel, so therefore we um, investigated the producers, the adenyl cyclase family members. Uh, RNA sequencing showed that the dominant expression of adenyl cyclase 6 and the moderate expression of 1, 3, 8, and 9, only the adenyl cyclase 9 was excluded from the potential regulatory factors because it's basolateral localization on the organoids. Um, you can see here four um, representative pictures, these storm pictures, um, demonstrating the possible physical interaction between the CFTR and the remaining uh, adenyl cyclases. But after cluster analysis, uh, we revealed that the adenyl cyclase 1, 3, and 8, which are the calcium carmodulin activated adenyl cyclases, are more prone to interact with CFTR. Moreover, simultaneous gene silencing of uh, these adenyl cyclases leads to a disturbed uh, uh, activation of CFTR, which was expected. What you can see here in the upper panel is uh, the physical proximity of the ORI1 and the calcium carmodulin activated adenyl cyclases. And uh, why the three color D-storm images uh, demonstrates the possible assembly of the membrane nanodomain consisting in ORI1, CFTR, and one of the calcium carmodulin activated adenyl cyclases. Uh, finally, we have investigated the store independent regulators as well, uh, such as the SPCA2 and the Septin7, and uh, we have found that uh, after SI RNA treatment of uh, most pancreatic isolated ducts, the constitutive ORI1 uh, operation was completely diminished after the SISPCA2 treatment. The same treatment caused uh, uh, reduced activity in uh, CFTR uh, activity as well. So taken together these findings, we can say with high confidence that the store independent regulation of ORI1 is promoted by SPCA2 ER membrane protein. The calcium flow through the ORI1 can turn on the calcium carmodulin activated adenyl cyclases, which can create a high micro niche of uh, CEMP that can activate the CFTR in a PKA dependent manner. I would like to thank to my uh, uh, mentor and, and my boss, Jozef Malet, for the guidance and uh, all what he, support, uh, he supported me for a very long time, and all of my colleagues and my collaborators. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Arpad. Uh, great talk. Once again, uh, please uh, uh, post your questions on the uh, app, meeting app. Uh, thank you once again to everyone. On starting Paul Webster lecture right now. You need some coffee. So we're going to have a coffee break for 15 minutes right outside here. And then please come back and we'll start the session uh, at 10.30. Thank you. <laughs>